So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jay Gu, who is in charge of uh, cartilage regeneration platform of Rocket Healthcare. First of all, uh, I would like to thank you for taking your time to visit our lunch and learn session. Uh, what do you expect when you uh, hear about 3D bioprinting? You may think about bone or tissue printing or scaffold printing, or you may also imagine maybe in future we can uh, print all the organs we necessary. But today, I'm going to introduce you realistic but very innovative way of cartilage regeneration with 3D bioprinting technology. As you know, conventional treatment in cartilage regeneration has not been so successful in terms of high link cartilage regeneration. By combining 3D bioprinting, AI technology, and autologous bioink, Rocket Healthcare took the significant step of developing regenerative medical technology that can be very ultimate therapeutic solution to our aging society. We call it organ regeneration platform. The concept of organ regeneration platform stems from the idea of creating a successful biological niche at defect region to induce cellular regeneration. Rocket's approach is to create extracellular metrics for the regeneration niche based on 3D bioprinting and autologous bioink. ECM is, as you know, composed of diverse levels of proteins, growth factors, and chemical signals. Using our specially designed bioink, which composed of this ECM solution generated from autologous fat tissue, Rocky's technology creates a 3D modeled ECM patch, which is directly implanted to the defect region for regeneration. Depending on its use of application, BioInc is customized by mixing with other biological elements to induce successful regeneration at implanted site. This is how we design customized cart cartilage, skin, and even for organs. Over the years of research, we have successfully designed our treatment procedure to be very simple. Maximum 90 minutes long and one step procedure to be done in operation room. Currently, we have ongoing global clinical trial studies to expand the application of our platform to various medical cases like aging skin, diabetes food ulcer, osteoarthritis, and chronic kidney diseases. Our 3D bioprinting device has already been registered as a medical device under US FDA. Without incubation of the cells, our procedure can be implemented right on the site as one-step treatment with our, with our own medical kit and AID software, which is also USA FDA registered. For cartilage regeneration treatment, we have successfully launched our first clinical trial in Egypt, which will be followed by further studies in other global regions. Today, I'm, going to I'm proud to introduce you two of our great pioneers who made a grand contribution to bring our technology for osteoarthritis to the next level. Dr. Charles Brandon is Director of Clinical Study Department of Massachusetts General Hospital and Principal Investigator of MGH Animal Study Project. And Dr. Mohamed, the Head of Orthopedics and Sports Injury Division in Asutu University Hospital in Egypt. As the Principal Investigator of the study, he will share with you a clinical trial report with some remarkable news from the patient. To begin with, I would like to give a big round of applause for Dr. Charles Brandon. Thank you.
As we know, defects in the articular cartilage can result in progressive damage of the joint tissue over time, which can lead to increasing pain and loss of function. Many surgical and non-surgical treatments have been tried, but to date, all treatment attempts have been, had unsatisfactory long-term results. Cultures of chondrocytes had been an attractive approach, but it turns out that these cells tend to de-differentiate de in culture very quickly, and so far, clinical attempts have been unsuccessful. New treatment options attempt to use stem cells derived from adipose tissue in the hope that the local environment will then result in chondrocyte formation. By using a 3D printer, a 3D tissue composite can be created that precisely fits into the defect area. The preliminary in vivo studies in rabbits have shown promising healing results of cartilage defects using this 3D printing method. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to perform a detailed study of the healing of the cartilage defects treated with a 3D printed uh, biocomposite using a canine weight bearing model. We used three biomaterials uh, in this study, stem cells, extracellular matrix, and fibrin glue. The stem cells were derived from adipose tissue collected uh, at surgery at Mass General Hospital from liposuction patients, and these patients were all female, uh, less than or equal to 25 years of age. The isolation method was uh, used was mechanical filtration, uh, referred to as MAECM in this uh, presentation, and this is considered to be a, minim a minimally manipulative method of collecting these cells. The extracellular matrix was lyophilized human costal cartilage powder, uh, known as LCCM, and is believed that this extracellular matrix supports cell viability, supports cell proliferation, and chondrogenic differentiation. We use fibrin glue as a resorbable matrix that suspended these uh, materials. We use 12 mature male uh, hounds uh, in this study. These 12 animals were uh, divided into four groups, three control groups and one experimental group. Group one uh, represented the empty defect control Group two uh, controlled for the use of just the LCCM powder and the fiber and glue matrix. Uh, group three controlled for just the uh, uh, stem cells in the fiber and glue matrix. And then of course the experimental group combined the LCCM and the, uh, the cells in the fiber and glue matrix. We perform uh, bilateral stage surgeries 12 weeks apart and the animals were euthanized at 32 weeks. Therefore, this produced uh, specimens for analysis at 20 weeks and at 32 weeks. We uh, created a six millimeter diameter defect in the lateral femoral condyle and the weight bearing area of the condyle in all animals. Uh, and the depth of this defect was one to two millimeters. This is the uh, bioprinter, as you can see here, and you can see more information of this in the AAOS booth number B21613. This is the resulting printed uh, matrix uh, from the bioprinter, and we used a modified bone punch and an osteotome to create the circular defect in the weight-bearing area of the lateral condyle. After this defect was uh, created, we dried the area and applied a small amount of fiber and glue to the base of the defect. After that, the matrix was applied to the defect and additional fiber and glue was added to secure the uh, patch to the surrounding host tissue. Uh, we performed MRI scans on all animals at 2, 4, 12, 20, and 32 weeks. We also studied the inflammatory markers uh, uh, one day after surgery, and then one, two, four, and six weeks postoperatively. After the animals were sacrificed and uh, uh, harvested, the samples were uh, tested for uh, mechanical compressive testing. Histological staining uh, uh, consisted of H&E and saffron O. Saffron and O uh, stains the proteoglycans in the uh, extracellular matrix. 
We also used immunohistochemistry to analyze the formation of collagen 1 and collagen 2. All uh, animals returned to full function and near normal gait within two weeks after surgery. They were all allowed unrestricted activity throughout the study period. And all, again, all animals were euthanized at 32 weeks after surgery. We used a modified Bocart score to analyze all of the MRIs over time. A trained uh, radiologist uh, at our institution read all of the um, all of the images and did the scoring and she was uh, an expert in analyzing MRIs of cartilage defects. We can see the subscores of the Mokart score here and two of them that I'll highlight in a moment is the volume fill of the cartilage defect and the signal intensity. And the signal intensity is very important because it suggests whether uh, it's a normal signal uh, representing cartilage or if it's abnormal. This is the results of the total scores of the MR, MRI grading for the four groups at the uh, five time periods. It's uh, difficult to do statistical analysis on these uh, because of the low number of subjects uh, within this study population. However, if you look at these subscores, we saw that at 20 weeks, the articular cartilage volume was less than 25% in the defect group. And the filling consisted of homogeneous tissue, and the signal intensity of repair tissue was abnormal. In contrast, the volume fill of group four, having the uh, LCCM matrix powder and the stem cells, was relatively higher than the other groups. Filling consisted of inhomogeneous uh, tissue, and the signal intensity was judged to be minor abnormal. Here on the right are examples of the MRI images at 32 weeks of an empty defect control and the uh, study group with the matrix and the, and the cells with the fibrin glue. We can see at 32 weeks a persistence of subchondral edema persisting in these empty defects and then also to some extent in the other two control groups. In contrast, there was minimal sub, uh, subchondral edema in, at all time periods in the study uh, group and we see the signal intensity uh, uh, suggests a near normal uh, cartilage tissue forming within the uh, gap re uh, defect region. The inflammatory markers, as you can see here, for uh, uh, MMP3 and 9, in both the group with the cells and with the cells plus the uh, uh, LCCM, they both showed lower serum MMP3 and 9 concentrations compared to the group at four weeks. And this was even more pronounced at all time periods with the MMP9, suggesting a decrease in uh, systemic uh, inflammatory markers in these animals. This is a montage of the explanted uh, uh, specimens at uh, 20 weeks and 32 weeks with the three control groups and the uh, study group, as you can see here. We found that the control defects were ingrown with uh, fibrous translucent tissue, which was relatively soft in texture. We also noted these globular uh, uh, white, whitish regions that seem to be forming and coalescing over time into a larger uh, clouds. Of the three control groups seen here, the control group with the LCCM, the uh, uh, extracellular matrix, appeared to the, be the most advanced in formation. However, they were all quite uh, soft and gelatinous in uh, consistency. In contrast, the tissue in the experimental group was much firmer and more opaque throughout the defect regions, both at 20 and 32 weeks. This is an example of the, uh, uh, one of the study animals at uh, 20 and 32 weeks. We can see that uh, the normal cartilage here and the defect at both time periods. We see these globular structures that do seem to continue to uh, uh, aggregate together. 
there's a suggestion that the uh, healing occurred from the center of the defect out as well as from the periphery in. And interestingly, we can see these striations or the lamella structures in the cartilage-like tissue within the defect region. We also see quite a, a good incorporation of the new tissue with the uh, intact host uh, cartilage at both time periods. The mechanical testing uh, was uh, quite difficult in the control groups because the tissue was so soft that we actually pushed through that soft tissue and ended up uh, measuring the subchondral bone stiffness. However, if you look at the normal cartilage and the uh, experimental group at both uh, 20 and 32 weeks, we see uh, a similar uh, compressive uh, modulus uh, readings uh, in the defect region in this experimental group. An interesting observation was that the uh, indenter uh, left a permanent indentation in both the hard uh, normal cartilage and the uh, cartilage-like tissue inside the defect, and that is in contrast to the very soft tissue in the other three control groups. This is H&E uh, and saffron and O staining of normal canine cartilage. We can see a surface layer, very smooth, uh, relatively acellular surface layer, a mid-zone with chondrocytes arranged in a columnar fashion, and, and deep to that is a tide line uh, separating the uh, normal cartilage from the subchondral bone. In the saffron and nose staining, we see that the proteoglycans are equally distributed within the normal cartilage, as would be expected. This montage is of the H&E staining of the four st uh, study groups at both 20 and 32 weeks. These arrows delineate the margins of the defect region, and then we have a higher power magnification in the center of the defect regions. On kind of casual uh, observation of, the, of these H&E stains, we didn't see really a visual distinction that really jumped out at you among these groups, uh, but perhaps it was uh, uh, suggested that the extent and the organization of the tissue and the progression of the filling of the tissue was uh, uh, retarded in the uh, three study groups. This is a, uh, an example of the defect with the cartilage-like tissue uh, grown in. We can see that there is some microfracture repair uh, deep to that surface, suggesting that we did occasionally violate the subchondral bone in some of these areas. And we see good incorporation from the host cartilage and the new ingrown tissue, as you can see here. The black and white image uh, uh, shows a very good contrast of the details uh, within this structure of this new material. Again, a relatively acellular surface layer, uh, 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 mid-middle zone with uh, chondrocytes appearing to start to arrange in, into columns, and the reformation of a tide line separating the uh, cartilage-like tissue from the subchondral bone. And again, here you can see fairly good uh, uh, incorporation of the new tissue with the host uh, intact cartilage. We did some uh, sc scoring of the, uh, of the histology samples. Uh, this is scoring of the H&E samples using the ICIRS visual histological assessment scale. We can see the subscores here, looking at the surface morphology, the makeup of the matrix, uh, trying to judge the cell distribution as well as the cell viability, uh, looking at the subchondral bone morphology as well as the mineralization uh, uh, within, the, within the ingrown tissue. A normal score for a, a normal cartilage is a maximum of 18 points. We can see here that at both at uh, 20 weeks and at uh, 32 weeks, the highest score was uh, obtained in the experimental group having both stem cells and the LCCM powder along with the fibrin glue. Uh, a similar uh, depiction of the saffron O and the collagen uh, 2 staining is shown here at both 20 and 32 weeks. And we found that the formation of the proteoglycans and of the collagen 2 
appeared uh, more pronounced in the experimental group. And just an example of the safran no in the experimental group here, we can see the uh, new tissue formed here. And uh, it was the most pronounced proteoglycan staining was in this experimental group. And it was seemed to be uh, forming deep to the new tissue layer and then progressing upward as one would expect. The scoring of the safran no staining in the immunohistochemistry scale, we can see it was judged by the extent of the safran no staining, the extent of collagen 1, and the extent of collagen 2. We see that the maximum score for safran no staining, uh, indicating pr uh, proteoglycan formation, was at maximum at both 20 weeks and 32 weeks in the experimental group. And we see, I believe that number is 8 and 9, uh, for the total uh, uh, grading score uh, in this study group. So in summary, we found significant differences between the MRI scans of the empty defect uh, controls and the group with the uh, stem cells, LCCM powder, and the fibrin glue. The uh, two groups having the cells and the cells with the LCCM groups also showed lower serum MMP3 and 9 concentrations compared to the other groups. This study has produced very encouraging evidence of cartilage repair using a 3D printed biocomposite. And in contrast to the experimental groups, the repair in the control groups appear to have either been significantly delayed or arrested. The next steps in the stepwise introduction of this new technology for clinical use is initial short-term clinical outcome studies, which you will hear in the uh, next uh, presentation. And this should be followed uh, by midterm multicenter clinical uh, studies, increasing the uh, size of the patient population and looking at the, the long term, longer term efficacy of this treatment. And then uh, if all goes well, we'll then be looking you know, further down the road five or more years at long-term national and international registry studies. And these uh, registry studies is uh, something that we uh, specialize in at MGH along with our uh, compatriots around the world. And we're looking forward to studying this new technology with the industry to see how well this can work in the clinical setting. Thank you very much. I'm going to present the first clinical trial of cartilage regeneration uh, platform. My name is Mohammed Abdel Hamid. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery and arthroscopy in Asyut University uh, in Egypt. <clears throat> in the early 90s, when Mr. Benz invented his first motor car, people were fascinated about this invention. However, they have never thought that in the future it is going to be an indispensable part of their life. <clears throat> the development does not stop there. There must be further development, and it's already there. I think the future is going to be for the flying cars, and I think in the future, uh, the sky will, will have traffic lanes for these flying cars. This is uh, the, uh, the development of any idea. Uh, it is made and developed to improve the quality of life of, uh, of the human beings. And I believe the same will, ha will, out will be for osteoarthritis. In the early 19s, uh, a case like this had only uh, a, a simple option for treatment is uh, applying hot fomentations. And physicians, but by that time, have only the option of putting the patient in above knee plaster cast for a few weeks. Nowadays, we have several options like the microfracture, the oats, uh, ACI or stem cell injection, and high tibial osteotomy, and even the arthroplasty. However, none of these procedures are satisfactory in the term of healing of osteoarthritis. The microfracture produces a weak fibrocartilage, for example, the ACI, uh, it's not for osteoarthritis, and it's, that it's a two-step procedure, and it's very expensive. And for the total knee replacement, or arthroplasty, it is the last option, and it's irreversible. 
So when uh, Rocket presented its idea two years ago in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, I was fascinated about the idea of 3D printing of the human tissues. They, they showed us this science fiction movie, it's a part of the fifth element movie uh, of 3D printing of, of the human body. And although that we didn't reach this stage yet of 3D printing of the human body, but I believe that uh, it is the first step to have a 3D printing for the human tissues. So their idea of mixing uh, uh, hyaline cartilage powder uh, uh, with uh, the undifferentiated stem cells derived from the uh, autologous adipose tissue of the patient and, um, uh, and 3D printing of this composite to cover the articular cartilage defects where it was a fascinating idea. They had also another study uh, of uh, uh, the difference between manual mix mixing of the adipose tissue with the hyaline cartilage and the 3D printing and they found that in case of 3D printed cells suspen uh, suspension and, and density of the cells are homogeneous which has a great influence on the proliferation and the viability of these cells. And because the, a lot of studies showed that the articular cartilage the allogenic articular cartilage is non-immunogenic. It, it, it has uh, uh, no immunologic reaction due to its immunologic inaction. Then I thought that it's safe to, <clears throat> to try it in the human beings. And after having uh, the proper authority approvals, whether the IRB or the, from the Ministry of Health, uh, we have done this procedure for 12 patients seven males and five females. Six patients had no deformity and six had various deformity of seven degrees or more, where the procedure was done with high tibial medial wedge opening osteotomy along the procedure. Our inclusion criteria were meticulous, including uh, uh, active range of motion of the patient, a single focal thickness cart uh, cartilage defect, the, uh, the patient should have no previous meniscal surgery and of course they must voluntarily agree to participate in the study. Our exclusion criteria were also meticulous including uh, the body mass index not exceeding 35 uh, uh, and not for patients with rheumatoid arthritis or gouty arthritis or patients who had ligamentous instability or even having uh, patients having intra-articular injection therapy of any joint within the last two months. Our follow-up was done at six weeks, three months, six months post-operatively, clinically and radiologically. Clinically, patients were assessed by the knee society score and the knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome score, the KOOS, and radiologically the results were assessed by the MRI using the Mockart score. The technique, although it has uh, several steps, but it is a simple technique. <coughs> Liposuction was done uh, uh, from the anterior abdominal wall of the patient, like any plastic surgeon would do a liposuction manually uh, uh, in, by injecting uh, saline mixture with adrenaline and local anesthetic, and then manually aspirating uh, uh, the fat from the anterior abdominal wall of the same patient. Uh, uh, at least 30 to 50 milliliters of fat were aspirated to be prepared uh, for the uh, 3D printing. The aspirated fat is handed to the nurse on a side table and the nurse started a process of micronization of the, of the fat, uh, which means fragmentation of the fat and transferring it into a liquid form through passing it uh, back and forward uh, through uh, my, uh, an adenizer. Uh, and, and of course, the adenizer gets smaller and smaller in size uh, to further uh, fragment this fat until it becomes more and more uh, of fluid nature. 
Then it mix it with the uh, powdered hyaline cartilage that is derived from the uh, tissue banks, costal cartilage from t tissue banks. As we can see, it becomes more and more fluid-like. At the same time, uh, the, the surgeon uh, performs arthros arthroscopy for the, for the knee, for the debridement of the ulcer, removal of the, uh, from the hanging edges of the articular cartilage and the loose edges. And then, uh, by the abrader, we remove the hibernated layer of the subchondral bone to prepare uh, the floor for the receiving the graft. And by performing measurements, the, the length and the width of that ulcer and the depth of the ulcer, then these data are fed to uh, the program, uh, a, a, a program that will work with the 3D uh, bioprinting device <laughs> that is called the Dr. In Vivo. The program transfers this data into uh, uh, a 3D shape of a scaffold. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the 3D printer has two stations. The first station was for the printing of the scaffold from a polymer, the, uh, a polycaprolactone polymer, with the same dimensions and the depth of the ulcer. <coughs> And then the bioink is fed to the second station, uh, which is going to print the uh, mixture of the, uh, of the fat and the art articular cartilage powder or the hyaline cartilage powder uh, within the scaffold uh, to have the same size of the uh, defect. And then it, uh, a fibrin glue is added to the composite to have it solidified. The graft is taken on a side table and washed, and, uh, and the scaffold is removed uh, and it's, um, uh, until it becomes uh, holdable by forceps. The graft is dried and that at this time the knee should be very prepared to receive the, uh, the graft without any delay in the outside uh, 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 environment. During the time of, of 3D printing, the surgeon should open the knee through a regular antromedial uh, approach uh, and prepare the uh, recipient area for the graft. And if the patient had a, a various deformity, uh, a high tibial osteotomy is performed during that time, it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to perform the 3D printing, and it's about the same time that is used to uh, do the procedure, the high tibial osteotomy and, and the opening of the knee, and then the graft is placed in its place, and then glued by fibrin glue, and uh, after waiting for a while until it solidifies, then the knee is taken into uh, flexion and extension uh, to make sure that the graft does not fall uh, on the um, away. So if, if we have an ulcer like this, uh, this is the shape after preparation of the ulcer, and then the graft uh, the, uh, will fit in, in its place exactly uh, after the 3D printing. Uh, our clinical results were fine. Uh, our, the, the mean knee society score improved from 144.8 preoperatively to 178 after three months uh, to 185.9 after six months. And the, K, the mean of the KOS score improved from 65.9% to 92.2% after six months. The MRI showed improvement also. The first column on the left shows the preoperative 
uh, picture of the MRIs, and the second column shows th after three months, and third column shows after six months. Let us take a closer look. This is uh, the uh, preoperative uh, uh, shape of the ulcer, and this is after three months. Uh, the, uh, the, we can see that there is a homogeneous tissue, and this is after six months, and we made sure that uh, we take the same site of the ulcer, uh, and this can be shown by the size of the anterior and the posterior horns of the menisci that uh, proves that it is it at the same site. Again, this is the preoperative MRIs, and this is the postoperative uh, MRIs showing uh, the homogeneous tissue uh, uh, that regenerated uh, at the site of the ulcer. And the MOCART score improved from 60 to 80 after six months. If the patient had a various deformity, we performed high tibial osteotomy with uh, procedure, and we can see the uh, uh, improvement of the MRI after uh, six months. Let us have a closer look. Look at the ulcer and shows a hyperintense signal at the uh, uh, subchondral bone. And this is uh, the shape of the ulcer after six months, showing a homogeneous tissue covering the ulcer. The same applies for the stair and showing a homogeneous tissue covering over the ulcer. The MOCART score Im improved from 55 to 70 after six months in this case. This was uh, uh, our enthusiastic team of uh, orthopedic surgeons, radiologists, and our uh, Korea, South Korean uh, colleagues. Uh, in the few, our future plan is to, after completing one year, uh, we should do second look arthroscopy and the histopathologic examination. Thank you for listening, and thank you, everybody. When you are burying the, the bone, you get any significant bleed. Do you have adherence problems then? Well, the, the abrasion of the bone of the ebonidal layer is like uh, the ancient procedure of uh, abrasion arthroplasty. It's just reaching uh, the, uh, uh, the tide mark, uh, uh, which is only removal of a very thin layer that it doesn't reach the cancellous bone. So it's, there is no profuse bleeding from the ulcer. There is no uh, 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 blood flow from uh, from the site of the abrasion. Uh, um, I have a question about uh, the pictures of the um, articular cartilage in the study. Uh, is that vascular invasion that is sort of surrounding the region? Um, knowing that you know, how the cartilage is really vascular, is that any concern? Uh, so, <coughs> that's what's happening in the study. Yeah, I didn't explain that uh, that uh, gross uh, photo uh, well, but that was uh, taken from a dissecting microscope, so you had quite a big depth of field, so that redness you saw was actually a projection deep into the layer. It wasn't just superficial. Yeah, you can actually see through it because of the, of the high depth of field of the microscope. Yes, please. I have a question. How old were these patients? What was the age range? Our inclusion criteria were from 15 years to 65 years old. And uh, 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 most of the patients were around 50 to 55 years old. But because we didn't reach the one year limit, so I didn't do the demographic uh, analysis of the patients yet. Were there any controls, that is, was there a group separate from this group that got the high tibial osteotomy, for instance, but nothing else to compare them to? Well, it will depend on the published data of the high tibial osteotomy results. Of the lesion on MRI or 
x-rays preoperatively that would exclude patients? How would you choose them? As, as I have showed in the presentation that we had, uh, our inclusion criteria was, were, was having a single focal articular cartilage defect that is apparent on the MRI. And uh, 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 this is, uh, I didn't, we didn't include uh, patients with advanced osteoarthritis for the study because it's our, our early steps. We are just feeling the way and and uh, and uh, and the MRI uh, pictures, non, it's not specific sequences or uh, not specific MRI. We didn't do cartigraphy, for example, uh, for these patients. Uh, only after the uh, postoperatively, the MRI of the uh, patients who had high tibial osteotomy should have uh, a special software to show the uh, ulcers and avoid the artifacts of the middle. I think this is a great idea, and I hope it goes somewhere, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. And any other questions? Oh. Yeah. I'm not sure that I understood yeah, the I question. I think uh, you addressed that a little bit when you, you showed the differences in just manually steering the material together and, and uh, letting it set versus 3D printing it. You get a much uh, more even distribution of the cells and the, and the matrix within the within the particle than you could if you just mix it together. Yeah. And it starts to settle itself as the takes a little time to farm and glue. Uh, the same, so I imagine that you have a lot of separation during that time. Okay. Are you uh, planning to do a clinical study with the manual mixing versus? With what? With the manual mixing. I think, I ah. think that would be uh, uh, prudent to do uh, the, you know, an experimental study showing that, that distance. And the experiment showing the, uh, the core mixing when you do it just manually, I think. Would uh, suggest that the 3D printer is a better way of doing that. Okay. You know, you know, many cells are very particular, and they like uh, certain arrangements, and they like a certain micro microenvironment in order to differentiate into chondrocytes. And perhaps this uh, is one of the key parts of uh, encouraging that uh, differentiation. It's a future futuristic idea, and I think in the future there will be lots of studies with a manual or 3D or highline cartilage addition or not according to the size of the ulcers, the age of the patients, the deformities, and there will be lots of stuff. It's, it's a futuristic idea, and these are the first steps. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. No, this is about it. Yeah. Uh... So if there is no any question, yeah, let's wrap up the conference today. And I'd like to thank you again for your attending and your time. And yeah, like I told you, please visit us, visit our booth located at B21613. If you have any further question or further uh, cooperation. So yeah, let's meet at the booth. Thank you so much. Thank you.